One. Okay. Hey there, everybody, and welcome to our show. This is the Day Tripper Photo Web Talk Show number 26, our special. It's kind of a part two to last week's. Uh, this week is on Nikon. Last week was Canon. This week is Nikon. We got to go back and forth and, you know, oh, tell the world. No. Our viewership just dropped. Oh, jeez. Well, everybody knows how good it is, so they don't need to watch a show to find out. <laughs> Well, that's the beauty of the brand, the brand wars, and you're going to find brand wars all the time. Um, we joke about it a lot. In the same breath, we will say that it makes no difference. I mean, there are some differences, and that's why we're doing this show, to tell you the differences, but not to say that one's better than another. Um, it is definitely not our intent to um, slander, or not slander, but trash another brand. Um, we last week talked about Canon, and we were on point every point that we made, of course, because we have to say that, right? We're always right. Um, <laughs> there is, uh, where's the disclaimer, Gabe? Come on. <laughs> I was not responsible for Brian always being right. Um, <laughs> but, we will crash other brains, but we won't mean it. <laughs> yeah, okay. However, two out of three day we're tripper talking web talkers. about Nikon. So what is Nikon? What makes Nikon mm. Nikon? There it is. Bum, bum, bum. Give All right. Me an, give me an I. Me, um, uh, what's next? Oh, yeah, K. Um, you know how long Nikon's been around? Anybody? As long as the debate has been around as whether it's called Nikon or Nikon. Uh, what is it? It's sort of a little bit of both if you look at the language and how they speak the language. So most people call it Nikon, and I guess that's the way it is now. I, I wouldn't. I, I don't know the details, but I would say that the Nikon Corporation was probably established on the 25th of July, 1917, when their leading optical manufacturers <laughs> merged uh, from a comp comprehensive, fully integrated optical company known as Nippon Kagagajuku Coke. Tokyo KK. I mean, that's just gas. Well, just, you, know, you know, pulling things out of thin air. But I heard there were actually three leading optical manufacturers that uh, that merged. So I guess you know you may be right. <laughs> Who knows? And I, I hear that that one of them, the, the major founder, he act, actually backed up and got caught up in the lens grinding machine. He made a spectacle of himself. Put a boom. Ay ay ay. All right, well, you know, actually, looking at the fact that it was Nippon Kogat Kogaku Tokyo KK, originally Nippon more translates to Nikon, so I'm going to go from now on and call it Nikon instead of Nikon. Fair? Okay. Okay, sure. Uh, <laughs> you can have some potato fries. It's some a tomato. Oh, yeah, tomato. Right. Yeah, yeah honestly, it makes no difference. It's a camera brand. They make great cameras. We have lots of cameras. And the first lens Koga is made... Kogaku. God bless you. No, that's how you pronounce it. Kogaku. I just put it into Google Translate. Oh, okay. There you go. Kogaku. Thank you. Um, so anyway, uh, <laughs> the, the fun part I find about Nikon, uh, aside from the fact that Mr. Snaps is an icon, Snaps is the best camera in history, um, bottom line is... There's there's a lot of really. Only good been in for repair twice. Only made him want to switch over to Canon three times. Actually, that was the original <laughs> Mister Snaps. This one's not been in repair once. But you know, technically, yes, I had some issues at the start. But that's electronics, everybody. That's a, that's a reality of the world yeah. we live in. Um, Nikon's have had issues. Canons have had issues. Pentax. I don't know if Pentax has had issues. Um, Olympus has had issues, but it, yeah, more more Olympus has had issues in the um, the financial area and at points. But uh, you know, bottom line is, Canon actually used Nikon lenses before they used Canon lenses. Nikon has been around a really long time. Um, they make great stuff. During World War II, uh, it grew to actually 19 factories. They had about 23,000 employees. Of course, they were supplying things like binoculars, lenses bomb sites, periscopes, and things like that to the Japanese mm -hmm. military. So it's a pretty diverse company, not quite as diverse today as, say, a Canon is with the printers oh, I mean, and the scanners. Um, and my wife's new glasses have Nikon glass in them. Uh, there's rumors about the Nexus 5 coming out actually having uh, Nikon hardware mm -hmm. um, in, in the camera, which would be 
pretty interesting. So they're they're still pretty diverse. And now that I think about it, Nikon actually does have a really strong lineup of of professional quality scanners too. So, you know, they, they are both very equal. Although in, in actual size, I'd say Canon is a larger company, um, but that doesn't really make any difference as far as what cameras they make. Hmm. Now. There's a serious difference in, in breakdown when we talk about the differences, but what we noticed with Canon versus Nikon. Uh, the point-and-shoot lineup from each manufacturer is dramatically different. Um, the Nikon point-and-shoot cameras, their their Coolpix line, they are small, very, very lightweight, and extremely inexpensive. I think you're going to find a lot of cameras from Nikon anywhere from $80 to $200, where Canon has maybe two or three cameras, Nikon would have seven or eight. So... Uh, they seem to have a stronger presence, at least in that category of the low price point point and shoot camera. Um, I think it's a natural progression for Nikon to look into working with cell phone companies to make better cell phone products because I have a feeling that that point and shoot market will dissolve in a little while. Do mm -hmm. you guys agree with that? Yeah, to a large extent. Um, I mean, it's not going to be as popular for the young kids. But the, the old farts are going to get tired of lugging around the big DSLR cameras and still want a camera. So I think the, the micro cameras are, are where it's going to go to. Yeah, that's that's a, the compact system camera is what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah, and you know what? In the compact system lineup, they do have a pretty strong um, foothold, and they just came out with their Quix A, which is a, a, I'm going to say it's a, a high-end Point and shoot with an APS-C sensor, so it's got a large sensor like a like a standard SLR, like a D7000 size um, image sensor. And of course, as we've talked about in the past, the bigger the sensor, the shallower the depth of field, the more the more filmic your photo will look, and also the more surface area is uh, there is for pixels to live. So you can have larger pixels, get better low light, and the um, the Coolpix A is actually we had one come into the store today. I didn't even know they were out yet. And a customer, I had just finished telling him, yeah, they're not out yet. We don't have any. And he brought his in. And I was like, don't I feel dumb? Uh, <laughs> you just never know what, you, you never say never. You never, never say never. Bottom line is he, he brought this camera in the store. And I actually, he let me hold on to it and, and play with it for a little bit. And, um, you know, for a camera that sells for about $1,150, uh, it's very plasticky. And it doesn't really give me this... I, I mean, honestly, it feels like a big Canon S100 without the metal feel to it. It's a fixed focal length lens. It's about a 24, 25 millimeter lens, f1.8, I believe. So it's, it's going after that Fuji um, X100 market, that kind of a thing, or even maybe a Leica type of range, but I, I don't know. It just it felt completely different. So it may be an interesting option. I'd like to give it a better try in the real world when they come into our store. Um, but at least I got to try the D7100 today, which is really cool, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. Have you guys got anything to add so far? Yes, I do. Have you checked to see whether the, uh, what do you call it, compact system cameras from Nikon share the same features that their DSLRs and point-and-shoot cousins used to have? Like what are you referring to? Like what am I, let me show you. So, in the menu system, I go into the menu system, and I'm looking around for something in my camera, and I want to change this setting, and I go, what does this do? So on any Nikon camera, they all have a built-in help menu. So a little question mark, you just hover it over the menu item that you're on, and it tells you. So the AF-S priority selection, choose from release and focus. Release, the shutter can be released even when the camera is not in focus. Or the option of focus, the shutter can only be released when the camera is in focus. That's so, a very good question. I don't know if they do that. I know on the point-and-shoot Nikon cameras, I didn't know if you were aware of this, if you're in the menu system and you hit the zoom in or zoom out button in the menu, it will bring up the help screen. I did not know that. Hmm. So that's a cool little feature that every Nikon camera's got a built-in help menu. And that can just be so cool for helping people out when you want to look for something to see where it is. I wonder if it helps people that don't want to shoot on any other mode but auto take non-blurry <laughs> pictures. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I don't want to know no. about that. All I want to know, like, don't tell me about all this shutter stuff. Well, if it's, it's going to be out of focus, if it's going to be out of focus and soft, maybe it's the shutter speed, though. But 
you know, and anyway, private joke. Uh, <laughs> um, you know what? I didn't know actually that they had a hover over information button, so I'll, I'll have to ch- double check that on the other point and shoots. But and, and sometimes would, if you go into the menu a little bit deeper, it'll give you even more help, and you may have to scroll down a screen. So then you have to hold in the question mark button and then scroll down. And it's it's been a help for me because there's been some times I wanted to change a setting and I wasn't sure, you know, is this the right one? And I went and I checked the help on it and, oh, no, that's not talking about what I want. That must be the different, the other one. That's interesting. Well, I know for a fact Canon doesn't do that on theirs. Um, so I will have to play with those and, and have a closer look at it for sure. Very neat, Darren. We always learn something really cool out of you. Mm-hmm. That's, that's really, really cool. You should take um, one of my workshops. You know what? I think a lot of people should take your workshops, seriously. Um and that you're, you know, just Henry School of Imaging or call Darren. Get that done. Um, yeah, really cool stuff. I didn't know you could do that. I'm going to have to play with that. Now, as far as everybody knows, if they've talked to me, the Nikon um, compact system cameras are not my favorites. Uh, they have a very small sensor. It has a 2.7 times crop manufac- uh, magnification factor. Um, small sensor, in my opinion, equals higher noise for low light. And... A different look to the photo. It looks more point and shootish. It doesn't look as uh, filmic because of that sensor size. It's a physics thing. It's not a technology thing. If the bigger sensor will make it look shallower. So, um, can I correct you on that? Please, I'd love when you correct me. Because Dr. Ross corrected me. Okay. <laughs> it is not the size of the sensor. It is the image circle. So, so the the, the amount of light, of light projected. The larger the circle of light projected onto the recording device, the shallower the depth of field will be. Okay, see, actually, that makes perfect sense, too, because then when you have a larger sensor with lenses that let in more, like, that have a full-frame um, back end, it will let in light to the entire surface. And if it was a smaller sensor, you wouldn't be getting all of that light. So that makes sense. Okay, you know, that's perfect. But and ultimately... It's easier, easier to understand as the bigger sensor the bigger the sensor is, the shallower the depth of field. And I'll just, you know, watch Dr. Ross cringe as we say that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, and that's, that, that's what helps so much about having somebody like Ross who is so good with physics and understanding how the light works and so on. Uh, he's been a huge mentor to me, and, you know, the guy is just fantastic to learn from. Um, it's tough, though, when you're, when you're in this industry. There's so many different falsi- falsities. Um, I used to sell car audio, and, you know, it's anywhere from peak music power output to maximum power output to if the moon is aligned with Jupiter and the tide is high and lightning hits your car at this exact point in time, maybe you'll get this much wattage out of that amplifier. And, and that, you know, I didn't realize it was that bad in photography, but the more I learned, the more I realized there's a lot of um, smoke and mirrors. You know, everybody's putting out these stats and things that they say are important, like pixels. Mm-hmm. Um, you have yeah. to have more pixels. You have to have more pixels. Well, Darren understands why you need pixels, which is why he bought the D800, and still there are reasons why you don't need that many pixels. Mm-hmm. Am I right there, Darren? You are, and sometimes, you know, an increase of quality of 15% is not a noticeable increase in quality of the actual photo that most people would see. You know, if I, if I have to point out where it's sharper, where you can see that it's sharper, then it's not really any sharper. That's valid. Right. Totally. So, I mean, that is something that is misleading, and you're finding a lot of these smaller cameras, and I'll, I'll use the Nikons in his, as an example. Um, if we're talking about a specific model, here, let me just pull this up for a second. Um, with their point and shoot lineup, they really are running that pixel war or the pixel. So I'm going to pull up the cool pix thing here. One thing about and... pixels, because I've been doing a little bit of research uh, for some video things that I'm working on, and a pixel is not um, not a measurement of size. A pixel is a device. So a pixel could be this big, or a pixel could be this big. Right, so the pixel is not a size; it's a quantity. So it's like mm-hmm. a grid. How many, how many, you know, squares wide? How many squares high? So, in essence, the in in capturing the light, the larger the receiver of the light information is, the better the quality of light that can be captured. So, if they've got a 12 megapixel point and shoot and a 12 megapixel you know, crop frame camera and a 12 megapixel full frame camera, 
the full frame is going to be better because it's going to have a larger area, so mm -hmm. the pixels themselves will be bigger. And that is literally the reason I chose the Nikon D700 over the Canon 5D or 5D Mark II, which was you know what was out at the time that I was making my purchase. They were talking 20 to 24 megapixels. This was half of that at 12. And for shooting wrestling and shooting these environments where I'm in very low light, it's exactly what I needed was less but bigger pixels or less pixels on a bigger surface, right? But now all the manufacturers have figured out ways to get better quality from those smaller pixels, so does it, does it really matter in the end? They're making it all up in processing and really good processors and so on. Gabe, you had something to say? Well, I was just going to say, I think it gets confusing to some people because, well, uh, a pixel is a device and it's not a measurement. Um, a, lot of it, a lot of industries use it as a measurement. So, you know, 1080p um, is, is actually... You know, or seven, uh, 1024 by 768 when they're talking about monitors. You know, so people see that as a measurement, but really it's just, you know, 1024 by 768, um, you know, each pixel could be this big, which means that it would, it would be, you know, super, super large. And, and then you start getting, into like, retina displays and blah, 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 blah. And it, it's another one of those wars where at some point, like the megapixel war, at some point... The megapixels don't really matter anymore. Uh, at some point, with uh, you know, like screen resolutions and stuff, it doesn't matter anymore because human eye can't even see it. But that's what the hot button topic, and so they just keep pushing it further and further and further down the line. Exactly. I'm going to do a quick screen share here, and um, this is just a few of the different Nikon point shoot cameras that are available this year. Uh, let's see, can you guys see that? Okay. Yep. Yep. Awesome. Um, so we have the Nikon Coolpix P520, which is a point-and-shoot camera with a massive telephoto lens. This thing is, uh, I believe, what is it? Um, uh, I think it's like 42 times or something like that zoom. It's ridiculously far telephoto. It has 18 megapixels yeah. on a point-and-shoot size sensor. Um, all the other cameras they have right now seem to be 16 megapixels. So they make some great cameras. We have the AW110. That is a waterproof camera. Uh, the L320, that's kind of a price point massive zoom camera. And, of course, the Android-based S800C, which was out for six months and discontinued. So mm -hmm. there are some you know, interesting ideas coming down the pipe from Nikon, but it'll be interesting to see if, how long it'll take for them to get away from the pixel war and start you know, going... A different route, and I guess In maybe comparison, that's my 7D with an APS-C sensor is an 18 megapixel camera. So, yeah, you know, smartphone a... sensor, 7D sensor. Yeah, <laughs> there's it's... a cool new um, app that you can get for a BlackBerry only on a BlackBerry with the Nikon cameras, and you can do a wireless picture transfer from your camera to your computer. I just 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 discovered that today. Hmm. And I can That's even do, yeah, I can do um, a live demo of it. So here is the camera. And if I um, take out the memory card, and here's my BlackBerry phone. Put the memory card on the BlackBerry, <laughs> <laughs> bring it over to the computer. No wires. <laughs> <laughs> that is your wireless transfer system. Wireless oh. transfer system. BlackBerry and Nikon, they got together. You gotta love low tech devices, man. <laughs> um, I'm gonna do a, another screen share here and bring up this uh, Nikon A camera. That's the Canadian camera, eh? A? 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 Yeah, but that would be E H. Oh, okay. A. This is the Americanized version of the Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see here, I mean, this camera is the one I was just talking about a few minutes ago. It's got that bigger sensor. Uh, it's a DX format, they call it, which is APS-C size. Um, it's about a 1.5 times crop factor if you were to compare that to film. Uh, it is compatible with the wireless mobile adapter for instant Wi-Fi sharing, and you don't have to set your memory card on top of it and carry it somewhere. Holy snikers, $1,400 or $1,100? $1 $1,150. Um, but this is where they're going for the bright prime point and shoot. But it's a big sensor with only 16 megapixels. So can I still so, use my other lenses on it? It's not interchangeable. Ah, you see, they're going to get you. Yeah, it is a fixed lens, prime lens, does not zoom. 
you have to use the two leg zoom system with this guy. Uh, so, yeah, that's that camera. Fun stuff. Lots of really neat cameras coming out. Um, not all of them, in my opinion, are the most logical choices. But one thing that really is super interesting me, interesting me, interesting me, um, we go away from these point and shoots. Uh, the cool picks, actually, you know what? The high end P7700 got great reviews this year. I really do like that camera. It's about a $500, $450, $500 camera. It has an articulating LCD. It has the larger size sensor for most point and shoots. It's not quite as big as, you know, an APS-C size, but bright lens does zoom. I believe it's about a five or a seven times zoom on that camera. And um, it, like I say, it's getting great reviews. It's doing really, really well. I really like the build quality of it. It's well made. Uh, $450, what are we doing? 19 scene modes, lots and lots of cool stuff. All right. And it's only 12 megapixels. You, so. remember, you remember when Henry's used to have the um, pistol pixels for pistols? Yes. You bring in a gun, they give you a camera. Yeah. Well, I was a, an instructor that used to teach a lot of those workshops, and the cameras that they were giving away were the Nikon cameras. You know, so good for Henry's and Nikon for trying to do something good in the world and, you know, get guns out. Yeah. However... So at the end of this workshop, were you just standing at the front of the room with a whole bunch of firearms at your disposal? Well, <laughs> let, me, let, me, let me explain to you what happened one day. These Nikon cameras, you've got to put it in the manual mode to get the automatic mode settings. So the manual mode of these Nikon point-and-shoot cameras was not manual mode that you're thinking of. The manual mode, and they called it manual, was like the P mode is on all the other cameras. P for professional. So yes. half the people in these classes would have, you know, the point-and-shoot cameras, you know, from um, the pis uh, pixels for pistols, the Nikons, and I'd have to tell them, no, no, on your cameras you go on the manual mode. No, 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 on your Canon camera it's the P mode. Well, I don't have a P mode on my camera. No, you've got the Nikon camera. You have to go in the manual mode. Manual. I mean, it was just at the end of the class, this old guy got up and he says, "Well, he says, you know, that gun I traded in, that was point and shoot." <laughs> <laughs> I like him. They are point and shoot. <laughs> so Nikon does have a somewhat confusing menu system, to which I think that they've changed it. I think they got rid of that. You know, in the manual mode, you know, on a point-and-shoot camera, make sure that it's set your shutter manually, set your aperture manually, not make it like the programmed automatic mode of every other camera. Yeah. Well, you know, in a perfect world, in a perfect world, there's so many cool things out there, and I think what would be really nice to see is a camera manufacturer stripping it down and coming out with a good quality lens, a good quality sensor, Forget about all the flashy miniature mode, fisheye mode, all that kind of stuff. Just make a good quality camera with a really, really nice lens and keep it at a Maybe reasonable... Like the Leica level. or something like that. Well, you know, I'd love to say that, and I will not argue that the Leicas are stellar, phenomenal, mm -hmm. awesome cameras, but I don't have $6,000 for one. Right. You, know? you see, that's the problem, is that people don't... Like, they just released... Uh, I know this is a different industry, but they just announced the... Um, Samsung Galaxy S4 last week, and it's like a minor, minor hardware bump from the Galaxy S3. It's it's really, you know, there's not that much of a difference in the hardware between one and the other. And then they spent the rest of the the one and a half. Uh, they spent yeah, rest of the you know two hour presentation talking about all this crappy software that they're putting in it. And it's like this really stupid, like when you're reading it and you get to the bottom of the page, it knows that you're at the bottom of the page and it auto-scrolls the page for you. And like things that you just know aren't going to work, things that you don't need, it's like, oh, no, this is too much work. <laughs> you know, like, like just dumb, dumb things. But people, they want the bling. They want, you know, that, that one feature that you can show off to your friends once and then never use again. Mm -hmm. And that's why these cameras have these stupid things that just take up room and space and make it unstable and crash. and uh, It's just frustrating. And that's really my point. Let, let's take a step backwards a little bit yeah. and focus on quality instead of toys. Um, and speaking that's, of, speaking sorry, of crashing, <laughs> let me tell you about a consistent 
they still haven't fixed it yet. Problem with the Nikon D800 camera. And that is sometimes when I turn it on or after I've taken a photo, the green light, you know, that says it's writing data to the memory card comes on mm -hmm. and comes on. And it's a good 30 seconds before it stops and I can do anything <laughs> with the camera. Is that well, not because you, your card isn't quite writing the data at a faster rate? I mean, a D800 is a super high res. No, that is a firmware problem that they tried to address one time already, and I don't think that they quite fixed it. It still pops up every once in a while. Hmm. And the only thing you can do is just be patient and wait till it stops flickering or <laughs> finish doing whatever it's doing. I had a customer tell me today that the D600, there's quite a few of them going back for service because of the dust issue. Mm. Apparently, the sensor flapping is creating its own dust or something, and they have to replace the entire shutter system, not the sensor, the shutter. Um, they have to replace the entire shutter. Now, again, people, I don't work for Nikon. I don't know if this is true or not. This is what a customer mentioned to me. So we're talking about it, and we're having conversation. Um, ultimately, I wouldn't own Nikon if I didn't love Nikon. And I'm certainly not trying to slag the company, but, you know, we're talking realities here, so... It was going to be the D7000 as well because the one that I use at work, I mean, they had it for a couple of weeks and the sensor dust on that thing is atrocious. Yeah. It's unbelievable. I was doing I, some demo shots for uh, the TV show with Ross and I was using the D7000 to take some product shots and I, I couldn't use any of them because just the one that we had at the store it was filthy, filthy, filthy. Mm -hmm. I don't know. that I, I think maybe Nikon has gone downhill in the sensor and the dust attraction system. I know that Canon had a really big problem when they came out with a 5D. Uh, that thing, you know, there were sensor logs on there to attract dust the size of trees. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, they fixed that on any newer Canon camera. I've never heard of dust being an issue. But I know I've run into dust on my D800. Uh, now, I, my house isn't exactly dust-free, so... I don't <laughs> Especially after all the work you've been doing telling us about so I know I know when I'm cleaning my sensor that you know I'm probably putting some some more dust in as, as I'm taking it out because it's just you know floating around in the air, you know it's it's all I can do. But I don't know it just seems to be it sticks more. Hmm. Well, they certainly have the oils around there, so they're a little bit more difficult to clean on your own. Nah, I've I've cleaned mine. I didn't run into a problem. I had to get some um, solution to do it. Actually, I got the the lens pen for the sensor, hmm. which uh, cleaned it up. Uh, real real quick. The lens pen, I was always concerned about those because you're putting pressure on the sensor. It's it's a piece of plastic. I know from taking apart my D7, my, my D70S camera, that it's just a piece of plastic. It's kicking around here somewhere. Here it is. It's in the little film case here. And this, this is the low-pass filter, so this is the thing that you would be cleaning. And it's just a piece of plastic. Hmm. And that is the low-pass filter that is missing. Hang on, let me make your box bigger. Hold it up there for a little while longer. There you go. That is the low-pass filter that is missing on the new D7100. Yes. I shouldn't say missing. They just don't put it on there because mm -hmm. apparently it, it keeps your photos just a bit sharper when you don't have it, which is why the Nikon D800E comes without the, that built on. Great. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's hardened plastic. It's... You know, if you're careful with it, if there's no grit on whatever it is you're using, I mean, it's just like cleaning your eyeglasses. So does that mean with the 7100 and the D800E you have to use a different type of cleaning system? Um, no, but, I mean, if you get a little bit of grease on there, then, you know, it's not the end of the world. I wouldn't worry about it. And uh, like I say, I, I cleaned mine. I think I got a little bit of grease wow. on mine when I was going around the edges. Something got on there that was a little smudge. Because I remember the first time I cleaned mine, uh, I had some issues, and I actually had to ask my manager, Nathan, to take care of it, and he did a great job. Um, so, yeah, it can be done, but you really do kind of need to know how to do it. So what else can we talk about for Nikon? Uh, we've talked about their point-and-shoot. We've talked about the Coolpix A, which is a new camera coming in. Uh, the D71, sorry? Why don't we talk about uh, lenses? Oh, great idea. Nikon, when they made their autofocus cameras they kept the compatibility with their old lenses. So you can use a 1950s Nikon lens on your current 2000 Nikon camera. You could attach it to any of them, but it'll only fully function on the ones that have the built-in motors. You should probably stipulate that a little bit. So oh, you're talking, assuming that you have an autofocus lens. Good point. 
I'm talking about the old manual focus lenses from the film days. Uh, Canon made a switch. They updated their entire system, which means no confusion for the consumer. But with Nikon, they said, well, we want to keep it so that you can use your old lens if you'd like to. So it would be manual focus and manual exposure, of course, uh, but you still can use your old lens. And then they came up with a new type of lens, autofocus lens, that the motor was in the body of the camera. One reason why these camera bodies are so big. So there's a motor in here that drives a little screw that turns the mechanism in the lens. Uh, then they come up with a newer type of lens that they have today where the motor is built in to the, uh, to the lens. Uh, so on a Nikon camera on the D5000 and D3000 line, you have to be careful because some lenses do not have the motor built into the lens. So if you're going to a place and the salesperson doesn't understand or doesn't know, uh, they could sell you a lens that may not autofocus on your particular Nikon camera, which I have had happen mm -hmm. or heard of heard happen. Um, I'm getting some comments coming in, and I don't know where they're coming in from. So let's just have a look here. It's not me. <laughs> that, was, that was me last night sending in the comments. Oh, Blake says, 8-core Xenos is a bit of an upgrade, Gabe. And the scrolling yeah. could be used all the time, even with photos and such. It's I, I responded to him in the chat, uh, oh, just saying... Okay that the processor in the 3 is already overpowered for what most phones do. Um, and uh, the software that they're coming out with is Samsung only, and um, it's not compatible with other phones, which makes it crap, because Android is all about open source, and um, we don't need things that only work on certain phones with other phones. And so neener, you... neener, neener. <laughs> you and Blake in the playground, three o'clock. <laughs> My dad can beat up your dad. <laughs> uh, uh, Joe, uh, Joseph Leduc also says that he has a D7000. He cleaned it within a few weeks, and he has dust issues once again. Mm -hmm. Hi, Joe. So, how you doing? Long time no see. <laughs> <laughs> Did you just see Joe? No. I uh, haven't seen him in a couple of years from the Richmond Hill Camera Club. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he comes to our club now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so neener, neener, neener. No, no, so neener, neener, neener. <laughs> Actually, he was in the store today. It was good to see him. He, he does a lot of work. Joe is always working. I love it. Yeah, he knows what he's talking about. He's one of those few people that knows, knows, more, knows more today than I think I ever will. <laughs> yep, yep. He's a good guy. He loves talking about it, too. So he's always, it's always good to see him come in the store. Um... Now another interesting thing that I feel Nikon, we we're going to talk more about lenses, but before we get to that, I'm just I just want to say one really cool thing. Did you guys know that Nikon still makes film cameras? No. They have two models currently available: the F6 and the FM10. The FM10 is more of a price point. It still looks like the old F65 kind of camera, um, but the F6 it's about a $2,500 camera, and it is a pro film camera. It's actually really nice. And um, I'm not getting one, but it would be tempting if I still shot film. $2,500 for a box that holds a roll of film and pulls it across. <laughs> and there's a built-in light meter that I could buy, what, a $500 light meter, that you know, the deluxe light meter model, you know, and glue it to the back of the camera. <laughs> so for a box that holds film, they're asking how much money? Um, now I feel bad for mentioning it. <laughs> Give me a second. I'm going to go make that out of Lego. And it's going to cost me about six dollars. <laughs> uh, at least Nikon has a sense of humor. Oh, that's great! <laughs> I'm going to see if I can pull it up here and show people. But for some reason, their website doesn't want me to look at it. So until that's, I call it conspiracy. Done, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll second that. Oh, here we go. All right. So the FM10 uh, looks like something. Like that, three hundred fifty dollars. Yeah. Not oh, bad. Three hundred and fifty for the okay. FM10. Oh, okay. This is their price point model. All right, and then we go back, and we check oh. out the uh, the F6. As soon as again, my computer. You can see it's thinking. My ultra high speed mm -hmm. Rogers internet is just really paying off right now. Thinking, thinking. Never mind. Who needs to wait for thinking? So, whoa, hello. Okay, so actually here it is. 
And then the F6, which is $2,400 to be accurate, looks like this beefcake right her. Like, does that have an option to put a digital sensor in it or? A digital back? Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's retarded. What I, I do mean, like, though, is the size of the LCD screen on the back. Yeah, to tell you your your ASA yeah. is set wrong. <laughs> <laughs> how many people look at that and think, how can I possibly see a photo on that? I mean, for that price, you might as well just get like a used Hasselblad. Or something. <laughs> well, you know, that's actually a really good point. When you consider sensor size is so important and so on, or, or film plane size is so important, if you were to buy a 4x5 camera or something and pay about that, that would make sense. But I don't know how many they sell. But it's interesting to see that they still back film. So that's kind of neat. Well, I mean, people will put it out there if someone wants to pay them the money. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. You know, I've got my D70S uh, on sale for eBay for uh, $50,000. <laughs> uh, some, somebody might buy it. <laughs> I've got the buy now option on it. <laughs> uh. Lenses, 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 lenses. Yes, the Lenses. the round things. Now we we uh, Nikon is so great, and it is, and it always has been. Um, Canon changed their mount in 1984 from their uh, from their manual focus lenses to their autofocus, and they were never backwards compatible without adapters. Nikon carried right through since 19, I believe, 71 or so, when their lenses were first, you know, their their main Nikkor lenses were being built, um, and they still fit their cameras today. In fact, one of my favorite lenses that I like to use is my little Nifty 50, which is the uh, the old style guy, the one that when we did the naked photography challenge. Mm -hmm. Just grab that out here and show you. So this is my original Nifty 50, and I don't know if you noticed, but this is the exact same lens that was on that film camera that I was just looking at there. Uh, oh. They had the 50 mil, $150 sucker on there. I just so have kill lens. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much was three thousand dollar camera with a fifty prime, one hundred fifty dollar lens. Yeah, I had an old nineteen sixties or nineteen seventies fifty one point eight that I just took apart just for the fun of it one day. Well, it's funny because I was only using this lens to show what aperture looked like until I got that reversing ring on there, and mm. now that I have that, it takes on a whole different meaning for me, you know. So, it's it's actually something that I'm I'm going to use a lot. And, um, you know, for the money you spend on a lens like this, these things are fantastic. Mm -hmm. The one I currently use is the, uh, the AFS version, the one that does have the focusing motor built into it because it does focus a bit quicker. But when I'm, you know, mounting a lens on my camera backwards, it's not exactly the kind of thing where I'm super worried about it auto-focusing quicker, you know? But, uh, yeah, so there's that. I've, I've still got my 24 that I had. 24, I think it was a 2.8. Mm-hmm. Not autofocus, but I mean on wide angle lenses. <laughs> Just, you know, sort of tape it to the I'm five feet away to infinity, everything will be in focus. So. And this has actually really helped a lot of people when they come in to buy a camera. If they say that they had an old camera and I ask what kind, if it's a Canon, it's kind of like, okay, well, did you get it after 1984? If so, you can use, you know, any new body on with your lenses. With Nikon, it opens up for so many more people that if you have these old film cameras, you can jump into digital and just replace mm -hmm. the body and keep all your glass, which is fantastic stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's a really, really good option for people who want to segue into digital who are still shooting with film. Um, of course, if you wanted to buy one of those film cameras, then I got nothing for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, there's... And that's great news for those two people that still shoot film. That's true. And you know, you gotta please, you gotta please the masses, right? You gotta please the masses. I still shoot film. Said nobody ever. <laughs> hey. the, next, the next day trip I'm on, I'm bringing my Nikon FE2 film camera. That you thing's should. gonna feel so small. You should. You should definitely do that. Um, <laughs> there's actually quite a few people who still shoot film, by the way. Um, Navi still shoots film for a lot of wedding work. Yeah. Um, there's this one lady that we have come in the store. She buys, you know, ten rolls at a time, and she just she that's primarily all she shoots. So it does happen, but that's actually 120 film, not 35 millimeter for her. I guess the larger film negatives are a little more popular still than 35 mil. And Navi's shooting full like four by five, of course. 
um, or medium format. Whatever. Uh, it's six, medium format. Yeah, yeah. Six, four, five. Yeah. I mean, I think that if I were to look at film again, I, I wouldn't do 35 millimeter. I'd be looking, you know, the larger, the larger formats. And that's the only way that I would see it. You know, trying to get a medium format or a large format digital camera, um, it'd be a lot cheaper to go film. And that, that's probably the only way that I would ever do that. But then you still have to take those negatives and send them out to get you know, professionally scanned, um, and, and, and that's then you, not cheap and takes a while. And you still have to process that negative once you get it back. Yeah. Yep. I bought a bottom of me a camera one time thinking that, you know, the two and a quarter format, you know, way bigger, way better quality, that's going to make such, you know, such an improvement in the photos I take. You know what I got? I got higher quality crap. <laughs> At that time, I didn't understand lighting and composition like I do today. Yeah. Oh, if you can only do it again. Hasselblad, higher quality crap. <laughs> Ooh. Once again, Day Tripper Photo does not endorse the sayings of Gabriel <laughs> Bousquet. Uh, actually, you know what I'd really like to know? I'd like to know what Ross thinks about his new Sinar. Oh, yeah. He just... Uh, well, it's a used one. Is oh, it? yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, yeah, I don't know if they yeah, make new, yeah. but um, I'm going to see if I can pull one of these cameras up to show people what it looks like. Um, when you talk about film cameras, Cinar, well, this is actually, yeah, I guess they do still have new. Um, this is what a current new film, new one looks like, and I'm just going to pull this up quickly. This is not the camera that Ross just picked up, but we're talking about a, a camera with amazing control, big, huge plate film. Um, Ross's is one of the older versions with the bellows and so on. Uh, but it's fantastic stuff, of course, but it is much more intricate. There's a lot more work involved. So mm. we'll, get a, we'll get a little review from Ross about how much he loves using his new camera well, eventually. Or how much more of his hair is white. <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think it'll be more of that than the other, for sure. <laughs> why don't we talk so, about... Why don't we talk like about... Nikon. Nikon's sure. cool... Um, flash system that they have. This is such a huge thing. Um, what confuses me is Nikon has this on their higher end cameras and Canon has it on their lower end cameras, which is kind of awkward. Um, yeah, the Nikon creative lighting system, I think, is what you're talking about, Darren? Correct. Well, first of all, with flash and Nikon, Nikon is more reliable more often than any other manufacturer of camera with flash. So when you fire with a flash, Nikon usually gets it right most of the time, as opposed to some other cameras that miss some of the time. So you know, thirty percent of the time, it works all the time. Exactly. <laughs> so one one of the the cool things I can just do a screen share here showing the uh, showing this menu that we can go into the, now on. All Nikon digital SLR cameras, you have the option of going into the manual power setting for your built-in flash, and then you can choose a reduced power setting or all the way up to full power. Uh, now what that can do is that can allow you more control in what's going on with the flash, make it more predictable. Uh, they also have on the, I guess, the D90, the D7000 series cameras, an option for repeating flash. So these are some settings that you can set to get like a strobe like a strobe like effect out of the flash. So you can make your on camera flash be a strobe light and get in front of the camera and dance and get all these, you know, wild nineteen seventy disco kind of effects. And I need to hit the OK button to get out of this screen, go back in, and then in the commander mode, this is where you can go in and control your built in flash, whether you want it to fire in the TTL mode. To, to not fire at all, or in the manual power mode. Can we just talk about that for one quick second there, Darren? Absolutely. Um, a lot of folks come into the store and they're like, well, I keep on, I, I understand the creative lighting system, I use it all the time, but how come, uh, like, I just wish that I can turn my built-in flash off. Can I buy that little flash blocker thing? You know, that little thing that slides into the hot shoe and, and goes in front of the flash yep. like a little wall? Yep. And I keep on telling, like, why do you need that? Why don't you just go in there and turn your built-in flash to not influence the photo? So, and that's what you're really talking about there, isn't it? So the mode of dash, dash. Now, you've got to watch the little triangles when you're going into the menu because it's easy because left, right, and up, down sometimes, uh, as in any menu system, 
can get you lost if you're not paying attention to where you're going. Uh, but you just set it to this dash dash, and then the built-in flash will still fire, but most of its light won't be recorded. You still will get a little bit of residual light coming into the photo sometimes, um, but only if you had a really slow shutter speed. So really what it's doing is it's firing the Morse code signals that it needs to do and then shutting off so that it's not being used during the main exposure. Mm -hmm. That's and brilliant. Then, and then you can control another grouping of flashes. So you could have as many of these on group A as you want. So one, two, I don't think there's a limit, as many as you can fit into a room. Or you could have them onto um, group B. So you have another group of flashes. So group of flashes on the left side, group of flashes on the right side. And then you can set a channel so that if you've got somebody else that's working around with their Nikon cameras in the area that you are, you just set yours to a different channel, and then yours won't interfere with theirs. So Now, in Canon's defense, you can do this on a Canon, too, with just a tiny, tiny little upgrade of only six to $800. I mean, <laughs> it's rather insignificant. Yes. <laughs> and, and going in on the Canon menu to try to figure out the built-in flash to turn it off and the group A and the group B is a little more confusing, I found. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, I think it's muscle memory. Once you get used to it, you can fire through it pretty quick. But, yeah, you're right. It's not as, um, as uh, cleanly laid out as that. Now, the, the only thing that always catches me up as I'll go in and I'll change all these settings, and at the bottom right it says OK. And if you do not hit OK, nothing changes. <laughs> so you've made all these changes, you've changed, taken all this time to set it all up, you hit menu, to, or you tap the shutter to get out, and boom, you've lost it all. That's it. Yeah, it's a good idea to hit OK first. And this uh, modeling flash, which is uh, turned off on my camera, that is, if you accidentally hit the depth of field preview, it makes the flash stay on like a continuous light so you can see where the shadows fall. Usually it just blinds your wife or your uh, shooting partner, Gabriel. <laughs> You've done that a couple of times. <laughs> I've had that done to me. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got a question from Kathy. Uh, Kathy asks, can we discuss the trade-off of sensor size versus cost and portability? as it relates to the Nikon 1 mirrorless camera. Can that give most of the power of a true DSLR, or is the smaller sensor a deal breaker? There's a follow-up question we'll get to in a second, um, but what do you guys think about that? The image circle. So the bigger the light source, the shallower the depth of field that can be created. So the question I would have to ask is, what is it she's going to take pictures of, and what does she expect in the way of a shallow depth of field? If you get the Canon digital SLR camera, whether it's a D7000 or the full-frame camera right now, I mean, the body you can always upgrade later on. It's when you're buying your lenses, that's where you're going to invest your money. So if you invest in the full-frame version of the lens, which is always downwards compatible, it'll work on any camera then you always have the option if you got the D7000 or the 7100 camera today you could always look at getting the you know D600 in the future or whatever that replacement model will be that will give you the shallower depth of field I guess if you're into bird photography and you're trying to bring them in closer then the smaller the sensor mm -hmm. also the equivalent magnification mm -hmm. factor of the lens increases mm -hmm. and then you're not really worried about the shallow depth of field effect you're actually probably trying to negated somewhat because uh, those types of high power zoom lenses tend to have a very shallow depth of field to begin with anyways. Like That's when true. we were shooting hockey, shooting hockey the other day, uh, Ross had his 1DX, which is a full frame, and a 300 millimeter lens on there. The next day he brought a 7D, which is an APS-C, and he could shoot it with a 7200 and still get the same crop fact, the, the same zoom level. Uh, yeah. So it's a much lighter system. Um, you don't need a monopod to run it, and you still get the advantage of the zoom. And that's a serious reason why I'm actually considering the D7100, because that has an additional 1.3 times crop factor. It basically has an additional DX mode on top of the 1.5. So mm -hmm. you're almost getting a two times crop magnifi magnification while still dealing with a, a decent-sized sensor, and you can put great lenses on there. So 
it's a really nice benefit um, for and, some cases. And it's for, let's just try to clear up this crop frame. You know, if this was a full frame image sensor, it's only seeing that part of the image. Mm -hmm. So I could effectively do the same thing by, you know, cropping in on this small blue area mm -hmm. after I was looking at my photo. Uh, however, because of the you know the way that it's only you know recording it on this small area rather than the large area, the magnification effect is apparently larger. Mm -hmm. So if you go with a camera that has a few extra megapixels, then you can crop it and you end up with the same. So it you know sometimes it really doesn't matter that much. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question fully, but they're also asking about the sensor size versus cost portability. Um, well, so I, are they talking about like larger sensor, larger camera? Because that's not really the case. Like the the seven D has an APS C, and the five D Mark III is almost the exact same size. So bigger f sensor doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a larger camera. Well, the Nikon one series cameras are a fairly small camera. I'm going to do a screen share here and show you what I'm talking about. Um, the one series is a camera that I have been very vocal about, and uh, not been the biggest fan of. And that was mostly because the first year I was selling them, I had a high rate of returns due to poor focusing, um, not quite the right image quality that people were expecting, and interface was a little bit awkward. Um, a lot of people, when they're buying a camera to be very straightforward, they want to have buttons to get here or get there. Everything in this camera is menu-based. So mm -hmm. a lot of people were having troubles. Now, the new uh, 1 Series V2, I do really, really like the thought of. Um, image quality wise I haven't put it through its pace as well enough yet but it's still a very small camera. It has a viewfinder which is something the other ones don't. It has a mode dial. Let's see if I can get to a position here to see um, right about, I don't know if you can see that little mouse right there, the little yeah. arrow. Right mm -hmm. there is an actual mode dial so you can choose your settings a little bit faster than in the past. But I think what Kathy is asking is buying these small cameras, it's nice because they're convenient and their cost is actually quite reasonable. Is there a trade-off? Um, is the picture quality uh, worse because you have a smaller sensor? Are we getting more noise? Is it slower? Is it, you know, an inferior product? Or is it worth spending the money and carrying the bulk of a DSLR? Um, in my experience, I love the... F when I was first sold on the concept of the One Series, I was sold on it because you could have less pixels, small sensor, small camera, small lenses, and get the exact same distance as a much larger alternative. For example, for Mr. Snaps here, this is a 70 to 300. Let me just take the hood off. That's a 70 to 300 in my hand. Okay, when it's extended, it's, it's kind of big. The, the same version of a lens from a Nikon would be about that big. Or for the one series, I should say. Mm -hmm. Now that is not a one series lens. I'm just giving a comparison in size. So right. the 100 millimeter, which is like a 300 millimeter or 270 millimeter equivalent for the Nikon, is literally about that big. So you're talking a dramatic difference in size and portability. So if they could give the same result, it is an attractive offer, right? I I don't know. I I would say that you know the little pocket cameras, you know, like this size that, you know, are thin, you can slip into your pocket, they're not bulky, or the big digital SLR camera that are more bulky, have more features, have more options. Um, they're trying to put those cameras sort of in the middle, and I don't know, I think that that camera, the V12 with that lens, that's getting almost as bulky as a D3000 or a D5000. Well, I noticed that on their website, they're not putting it in somebody's hand and showing you what it looks like like they did with the other one. Oh, wait, here we go. Here it is. It's, yeah, it's not going to fit in a shirt pocket, so you might as well have an SLR. So I want to. If, if I wasn't wanting to carry a heavy camera, you know, if I'm carrying that around, well, I may as well just carry, you know, the the bigger cousin. That's easier to get at controls. They have more controls on it mm -hmm. to get or more buttons they can put on it because it's a bigger area. You know, take a pocket camera. I think everybody has their opinions. In my opinion, um, this V2 is about the same size as a, a Nikon P520 point and shoot camera with 42 times zoom, which does a great job, and has the same size sensor as this camera, very much the same size. Um, I'm sorry, to me, I would spend $450 and buy a P520 
with every feature I would want with buttons really easy to get to and a viewfinder and an articulating LCD screen rather than getting one of these cameras. I think this is kind of a stepping stone product. I think this is a, a market that they're trying to establish and get really strong with, like the Panasonics and the Samsungs and the Sonys. Um, I would say the Sony compact system camera and the Panasonics are some of the most respected. And of course, the Olympus OMD is one of the highest rated versions of these styles of cameras. Weatherproof. I mean, you can you can beat somebody down with one of those things. Um, and I think Nikon still has a few years of development before they get to that point, at least in this category. I don't know, Kathy, does that help? I hope that helps. Um, second part of your question is, uh, is there an, isn't there an adapter that allows old manual lenses that you're taking to work, um, that you were taught, oh yeah. So the old manual lenses from Nikon, there is an adapter to use those on the mirrorless cameras. Um, it's about $250 or so, $230, and it converts the Nikon uh, standard mount to the compact mount. So yes, and that's a, that's a great feature if you think about it. The fact that these cameras give you a 2.7 times crop factor, you can take a 50 millimeter like I was showing you, that little nifty 50, you can put that on this and that becomes a 135 millimeter f1.8 lens. So you could put a camera on your 70 to 300 lens. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, <laughs> see, I'm actually thinking the opposite. <laughs> I'm oh, thinking okay. You, you could put a camera on my little lens and have it look far and be extremely bright aperture. But sure, yeah, put it on the 300 mil. That would be what a uh, 300. That would be a 570 millimeter or so. Awesome bird lens. Yeah, really good, right? If you think about it. So. And this is where you have to play with these cameras and check out the image quality for yourself. Um, I see lots of reviews that people put out there, and they're giving the, their opinions on picture quality and color and saturation and so on. I am a firm believer of if you want to get the best impression of a camera, try it yourself. Henry's has the company called Headshots. If you want to see what a D7100 looks like, rent it for a weekend. If you want to see what a D800 looks like and you want to try it out and put it through its paces with an amazing 70 to 200 lens and you don't want to cough out the, the six grand to buy it right away, you want to be sure you're going to get it, rent it from Headshots. Call me at the store. I'll arrange it for you. I mean, it's pretty straightforward to do. Or call Headshots. Go to headshotsrentals.com. I believe it's even just headshots.com. Um... These are great ways to try a product before you buy it. So, just a thought. Throw it out there. I don't think they rent the one series cameras though. But yeah, headshotsrentals.com. Headshotsrentals.com. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, <laughs> Sean asks a question. What what you you folks think about Nikon teleconverters? Sean, are you a teacher? <laughs> Sorry, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what do you folks think about the Nikon teleconverters? I, I love them. Have you had a lot of experience using Nikon teleconverters, Darren? No, I've never used one. No, uh, I, 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 don't have have a, I don't have a lens that I can use one on, so that's why I have not used one. It's not because I don't think that they're great or I wouldn't. Mm -hmm. The new version 3 teleconverters are, are flawless. They work really, really well. Uh, they are not cheap. I believe you're spending about $600 on something like that. Okay, for those of you who haven't um, figured out what we're talking about, Nikon teleconverters or teleconverters in general are adapters that you put on the back of your lens between the camera body and your lens, and they basically multiply the distance of your lens. So if you have, let's just use the example of a 70 to 200 f 2.8, and I use that example because that's one of the lenses that is compatible. As Darren says, not all lenses are compatible with teleconverters. Um, the 70 to 200 f2.8, if you put a 2 times teleconverter, that becomes a 400 mil lens. So you're doubling your distance, but when you double your distance, you also double your aperture. So a 2.8 becomes a 5.6. Um, one thing that I'm very, very happy about with the D7100 is that it is now allowing you to have full autofocus up to an f8, which means that you can buy the 70 to 200 f4, which is a much, much lighter version and $1,000 cheaper than the f2.8 version, put a 2 times teleconverter on it, that is now a 400 f5.6, no I'm sorry, uh, forget about the 2 times teleconverter, you don't need it, it's built into the camera. Start again, 
<laughs> 7200 f4. <laughs> you put it on this camera. It's a, it's a basically a 7200 f4 times 1.5 because that's the size of the sensor. So with the new 7100, you can actually put on a teleconverter. You can make it a 400, and then it'll work up to an 800 f8, which is beautiful. And this is this is something that the cameras haven't done lately, so or ever. No, so they do. This... Nikon does have the 1.4 times and the 1.7 times, so you don't have to go to the full two times. And the full two times, you would, of course, have to double the aperture. But on the 1.4 times, I uh, would only be 1.4 times the aperture, or something like that. And it, and that's actually what a lot of people end up doing. Um, and the bigger the teleconverter, the farther you can see. And for birding, you're able to get much closer. And that's really the whole point of it. The problem is a lot of cameras, when you use these teleconverters, won't allow autofocus. And the 7100 is allowing autofocus. So it gives you a little bit more flexibility. Yeah, I, I think the Nikon teleconverters are fantastic, Sean. I would definitely recommend them. And I think I know a place where you can pick those up. But we'll talk about that. Uh, <laughs> um any other questions out there in the wild world? So far, so good. All right, so let's talk about some poop. This is the poopy section of the show. Um, what really frustrates us about Nikon? We did this with Canon. Uh, of course, I had a little more to say than Gabriel did. So now, luckily, Gabriel's been using a Nikon for a little while. And uh, maybe you can kind of take over this part of it, give an objective view of what you think is um. good and bad. The, the, the main thing that bugs me about Nikons are the users, really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had that coming, didn't we, Brian? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's about time. Give, give him the floor and look what happens. <laughs> no, the, the, uh, the main thing, uh, you know, the, D, the D7000 that I use at work, um, <clears throat> the sensor dust is driving me nuts, but... Whatever um, the the main thing that drives me insane more than anything is on my Canon on my 7D um, when I'm tethering to Lightroom I can still use Live View um, which is great for product photography when you're trying to zoom in and get just that right focal point you zoom in using the Live View on the D7000 and I know some Nikon's do this some don't but as soon as you plug in the USB cable it turns off the Live View and there's nothing you can do about it and that just seems so bizarre to me that they that they would you know build that in so maybe they can fix it with firmware or something like that but it just drives me insane because um, that it also it's a little bit slower to be detected by the camera again my 7D I plug it in boom the, the, the computer sees it and you're good to go the D7000 can sometimes take up to 30 to 45 seconds for the computer to see it so if I'm shooting a really difficult piece I have to unplug it turn on live view zoom in, get my focus just right, plug it back in, eat a sandwich, make a coffee, and then I can go. So, <laughs> so yeah, that, that kind of drives me nuts. So that job's kind of making you fat then, isn't it? You got all this time to <laughs> sit back and eat food. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's the job. Yeah. <laughs> Is, is that the only um, thing that bothers you, though? Like, you uh, you mentioned the dust on the sensor. That makes sense. And then the yeah. live view tethering. I'm scrolling down my notes to see if I put anything else. Well, one thing that bothers me, and I think a lot of Nikon users will probably back me on this, is the rubber grips. Um, see if I can bring Mr. Snaps a little closer. And that's, this is a problem that I sent back to Nikon a couple of times. That's specific only to the 700, I believe. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but kind of peeling back a little bit. And this is something that happens on all of them. The problem is it's got a bit of a ridge here. And every time oop, it got a bit of a ridge right here. And every time it goes in and out, out of my camera bag, it rubs on that ridge. Hmm. And whether I'm holding it or not, and my thumb right there, of course, and I'm trying to grip bend that over a little bit. So the placement has been adjusted. I, I was really checking that really well on the 7100. And the 7100 is a completely different body than this and it's really smooth and clean in there, so I don't think that that would be a problem with those cameras, but... I've got a D300. I've got a D300. It's not a problem on that, and my D800, it's not a problem. It's only on the D700 that that grip rubber coming off is, a, is an issue. It's only specific to that one model of Nikon camera. 
And I guess that's why they don't make that camera anymore. What, or one, one, thing that, one thing that really burns my butt about my D800 camera is that's, you know, their newest uh, model so far. And that's not a, you know, consumer level camera. They're, they're aiming that one at the mid-level professional, uh, which is what I am. I snap somewhere, I don't know, 80,000 80, shutter actu actuations a year. I don't know how many photos that actually turns into. You know, I'm using my camera every day, and one thing I really wanted to do with the D800 that I can't do is use it very quickly to switch from taking still photos to taking my virtual two or 360 degree photos. And it's something mm -hmm. that I could do very easily if I had a Canon camera, but on my Nikon camera, it's just uh, a pain in the butt to do, and it's just so confusing. And that is their silly menu bank system, and they've just never grown up and gotten rid of this thing. So I've got custom settings menu bank D, and it allows me to choose A, B, C, or D, but this is only in the pencil menu. Then I'd have to go up and I'd have to change the shooting bank menu. And again, they've got four different options here. But that still doesn't set everything. There's things like your bracketing, like your ISO, uh, playback options. Like none of those things are in a menu bank. So if you want to, you know, turn the display off, turn this option on, like i got to go through and reconfigure the camera. It takes me five minutes to set everything properly. Whereas, um, you know, on the other camera systems, you can program in all of that stuff, and this is a firmware thing, so it should be easy to do, program all that stuff in, hit the record button, and then it resets to those uh, default values every time. Hmm. So to me, that's making this camera very unusable for what I want, and if you've got, you know, if they're giving you the, the menu bank options, well, why don't you let me record the settings, but all settings in the camera? Yeah. That, that's that's a big problem. I mean, you need to flip around your settings fast, and you like to set things up the way you like them. So it'd be nice if it worked with you a little bit more, right? Eh? Oh, absolutely. Um, I just got another question from Steve. Steve asked uh, actually a couple questions. Both of them were pretty good. Uh, first off, what do we think about uh, Nikon flash versus third-party flashes? So what we're asking is the Nikon flash system versus, say, METS or... Um, Nissan, I guess. Who else is out there for third party a third party flash? Uh, mm. Is that uh, Honol or something like that? Honol doesn't do the flash; they do flash accessories. Oh, as far as I know. No, the, there's the one that uh, Ross dropped. That was the Mets. The Mets. There you go. Mets. Mets. Honol tomato pickup truck. It's all the same thing. <laughs> I like the Mets flashes. I really, really do. I think they're well made. They've got good warranty. They're made in Germany. They're really reasonably priced. They're extremely bright. The major difference that I find, if I can just speak up first, is that um, the Nikon flashes have a much finer fit and finish. Um, their buttons are much easier to work with. You can flip it into remote mode. You can flip it into commander mode or um, uh, master or slave mode really, really quickly and easily. Uh, just by flicking a dial, whereas the Mets ones, you have to hold two buttons down, go into a menu, go down to the sub-menu, choose the option you want, activate it, and do all that. So the button configuration and all that on the Nikon flashes are way more advanced today than the Mets are. But Mets just came out with a new, um, I believe it's the Mets 59 or something, where they actually have a digital display on the back and it's touchscreen. So it should be very much the same kind of thing. I've, yeah, I've never that. used the Mets flash. I found the, the Nikon flashes uh, to work really great. I've got a 600, an 800, and a 900, and they all they all work fine. They yeah, the no Nikon, problem. those are actually workhorse flashes for sure, uh, especially the 800, super powerful. Everybody that shot Nikon, I'd say five years old and older, the 800 was the go-to flash. Mm -hmm. Not even five years, maybe four or three years. When when you drop them, they're small enough, you know, that they don't, you know, scatter their parts too far, and and they're built well enough that you just put them back together, they all snap to back together again. <laughs> so it's, I've never had anything break off that hasn't been able to snap back into place. Nice. Yeah, um, Gabriel mentioned a few minutes ago that um, Ross, our friend Ross, um, dropped his Mets flash at our camera club meeting in the middle of a portrait session that we were doing. And it, it's scattered, and there were some issues, and it's not quite the same friendly flash that it used to be. Um, but, uh, yeah, if, you know, if you drop something, it's never a good thing. So 
once again, Day Tripper Photo does not recommend dropping flashes and other things. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, Steve asks, what about the Nikkor lenses versus third-party lenses, quality versus price versus long-term value? And Actually, that's a, that's a really, really good question. Everybody knows that I love Sigma lenses. I, I love them. I love the company. I love Gentech Distributing. Uh, I love the people that work there. These guys are excellent guys. They know their product in and out, and they make a really quality product. Sigma is just coming out with a whole new line of lenses, their art series and a couple other different lines that they're coming out with. The, the design is much nicer. Um, and, of course, there's still great build quality. But what I love the most is they've got twice the warranty of Nikon. They've got 10 years the warranty of Canon. Um, so, for example, Canon has a one-year warranty on all their lenses. Nikon has a five-year warranty on all their lenses. Sigma has a 10-year warranty on some. Five-year on the others, 10-year on their gold band product. Uh, that I find between them is that the Sigma brand doesn't quite focus as quickly. It's got a bit slower action than the Nikon, mm -hmm. um, especially when we're talking about the nano lenses from Nikon, their high-end series. You know, you press the shutter down and it focused half a second before you press the shutter. They're that fast. Where the Sigma one is kind of like, zzz, dee -dee, zzz, dee -dee, and the Nikon is just like, dee -dee, dee -dee, dee -dee, dee -dee. so, and and that sound effect is mine. If anybody else uses it, I'm going to sue you. <laughs> no, I found that when we were looking at the 7300, we bought the Sigma first, and we were using it for weddings and in low light. Um, it would seek a bit. It would it would get focused, but it took a little while for it to do it. And right. then we returned that. We got the Canon 70 to 3, 70 to 200, and it's just bang, bang, bang. Now, in the same breath, we should mention that the Sigma one was 15.99 when it's yeah. its most expensive. Usually yeah. thirteen ninety nine, and the Canon one is now twenty seven hundred dollars and twenty seven hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. Um, if we're going to compare Nikon, we're talking twenty four hundred dollars versus fourteen hundred dollars. So there's still a thousand dollars cheaper across the board for that high end product. Thousand dollars is a lot of money, guys. I spent less than that on a lot of cars that I I've owned. So, you know, if if we're going to be yeah. real here, um, to spend a thousand dollars more, it better be good. You know what I'm saying? Um. Now well, there there are differences if you're comparing the 24 to 70 versus the 24 to 70 Nikon and, and Sigma, um, and you notice I'm not really talking about too many other brands of uh, third party lenses. Um, there's there's a lot of stuff out there that's not quite even close to as good. You'll notice you get chromatic aberration, slower focusing, um, incompatibility with some cameras, and so on. Um, but if we're going to compare decent product to decent product, let's go 24 70 versus 24 70. The Nano 2470 from Nikon, way faster. There's a substantial difference there, and we're talking $600 difference. Um, in my opinion, sometimes it's worth it to buy the brand name, and sometimes it's worth it to buy the off-brand. I think it's just my, trying them out. My Sigma 10-20 to 20 that I uh, used to use for my interior photos, uh, great lens, uh, dropped it on the floor, and, you know... It, didn't kill the lens, didn't kill the camera. Uh, the rubber grip on it is still good today, other than some tape that I put on it, and now it's starting to peel the rubber off. Uh, versus the new Nikon 16 to 35, so for my full frame, it works out to about the same thing. And the rubber's already coming off on the, uh, on the barrel, on the uh, zoom barrel. And uh, as far as the sharpness goes, yeah, maybe the Nikon is a wee tad sharper. Uh, but not so as you notice. I mean, I could have changed the level of sharpening that I did to uh, fix up the Sigma. So, you know, quality that way in the wide-angle lens uh, category. And that Sigma lens was, I think it was a, a steal around, um, uh, I don't know, I just took it out of Brian Sturr when he wasn't looking, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wondered where that went. <laughs> Um, Joe uh, Joseph LeDuc, we talked about him a few minutes ago. He made he made another comment. He uses the Mets 60 CT fours, which are almost as old as Darren, and I <laughs> and he can pick Thanks, up for Joe. less <laughs> and he can pick up for less than two hundred dollars. Uh, more power, very fast, and super dependable. I only shoot manual mode, and he has SB 800s as well. But he hates them in auto. Now, it's funny, and I was just kind of reaching back here to grab something. Gabriel and I went out shooting one day, and I brought my um, potato masher Mets. This is similar to the one that Joe's talking about. This is actually the Mets 45 CT1, not quite the same output as the 60. Uh, similar size. It's got the bounce head. You can spin it all over the world. 
we were shooting some old abandoned houses up on St. John's Side Road, and we were standing how far away from the house, Gabriel? A couple hundred feet? A mile. A while. Uh, we were really quarter, far quarter, off. Quarter mile, half mile around there. And <laughs> not quite that far. <laughs> Realistically, come on. Um, let's say 100, 100 feet, 150 mm -hmm. feet. Mm -hmm. And it totally lit up the entire house from the top of a hill. These things are so bright. and They're great for when you're not trying to attract the police's attention. Yes. <laughs> and if you get their attention, they're great for blinding them so you can run away. Wait till they put on their night vision goggles first. Then, poof. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's juicing up. She's juicing so, up. So, no, the, the, six, the 60s, well, I mean, it's a guide number. So the, the 60 is almost... Twice as powerful as the forty-five. Yep. And you know, Joe, Joe saying that using it on the manual power. I mean, it's consistent. He knows his distance, and he's been doing this long enough that he knows how far away he is. He either adjusts his aperture or he adjusts the power setting on the flash. So he's just got this internal metering system that works, and he knows that you know, on the bright dress, it's going to reflect more light. On the dark-skinned person in the dark suit, it's going to absorb more light. Mm -hmm. So he's right on top of it. And that's the thing. When you know your tool, we talk about this on every show. When you know how to use the tool you have, you can get way more out of it than somebody who just wants to shoot on auto and, mm -hmm. you know, not care about learning how to use their, their tool. So seriously, everybody, you should learn how to use the craft and learn how to use the tool that you have, and you will get so much more pleasure out of, of photography. I'm a firm believer of it, and it's it's proof is in me because... Before I understood any of this stuff, it was like, whatever, just take a picture. But once I started understanding it, you're attracted to it for so many different reasons. You're attracted to it for the science, the technology, the art, um, the gadgets. Some people it's just really love gadgets. One of the, it's really one of the um, mediums, uh, one of the disciplines where art clashes with science the most. <laughs> That's yeah, true. the telephone industry. <laughs> <laughs> One now, one thing about focusing, though. Oh, mm -hmm. sorry, Gabriel. You're going to say no, something no. else. Go ahead. On the Nikon cameras, this is specific to Nikon. On their point and shoots, on their digital SLR cameras, on any Nikon camera, sometimes they don't focus. So there's little monkeys inside that are always looking for things to do, and sometimes you got to turn them on their ear. So the little oh, trick yeah. for the Nikon camera is just tilt it sideways. Press the shutter button down part way, and it will focus. It sometimes does not like any kind of horizontal lines of contrast. Uh, now, do you know? Cameras. I was just going to say, do you know if there's going to be any difference now with the D seventy one hundred that it has those fifteen cross points? We can try it out in the store next time I'm there. But that stripe in the classroom, that orange stripe. You put the camera dead level on it, and it has trouble focusing on it. Turn it hmm. sideways, no problem. Hmm. Interesting. So it has to hit a couple sensors or something. Weird. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that too. And in fact, I was shooting a wrestling event and I had a lot of trouble with the D800 specifically not locking focus so it wouldn't take the picture. So uh, that's when I stopped using it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I mean, it's right. When you learn your tool, as Darren is saying, he learned that through mm -hmm. through usage. If you just do that, it makes all the difference in the world. So... Why not just do that, right? And then Joe will have to put on his earplugs because I'm talking about using the camera in something other than the full manual mode. But um, a couple of little things. On the older Nikon cameras, if you wanted to darken or lighten the picture using exposure compensation, you used to turn it in what would be the awkwardly opposite direction. You know, you'd go in the downside to go up and the upside to go down. And on their newer cameras, they've now changed that and it is now the positive side will go in the positive value and the negative side will go in the negative value. Uh, so for things like exposure compensation, uh, most notably, you'll, you would notice the change if you had an older camera. And I like on the, the Canon, I actually just found in the menu, I think they just added it with the recent firmware update where you can switch that to whatever you want. Which is oh, nice. okay. Yeah. That kind of allows you to reverse the dials, but it's everything. It's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. So mm. you couldn't... Couldn't reverse it just for uh, just for one task. Also, okay. on the half press of the shutter button on the Nikon cameras, it only locks the focus, doesn't lock exposure. 
So last week, we were talking about if you lock in the focus somewhere where it's really bright and point the camera in a slightly different direction, you would lock in your exposure, and the Nikon mm -hmm. camera's default to doesn't lock in the brightness, will only lock in the focus. Hmm. Actually, um, I was playing with the 7100 today, and um, at one point, I was trying to see where the back focus button is. You know how we've talked in the past about the back focus button? You hit that to focus, and then you can just take your picture anytime you're ready. Mm -hmm. boom, boom, boom. It's much quicker that way. So I'm looking at the D7100, and of course, it's like a D90 where, and a D7000 where it only has the AEL and the AEF button on the back. It doesn't have a separate button for autofocus on like the 700 does, or the 800, I think, has that too. So I, I figured, well, you can go into the menu, and you can program the AEL button to do the same thing. So I did that. Um, I programmed the AEL button to be your back focus button, and it was great. And taking pictures, and everything's fine. So I set it down. I tried it a few minutes, and I'm trying to take pictures with the shutter. It's not focusing. I'm like, what's going on? The camera's broken. What's <laughs> happening? So it totally overrode this shutter focus for the back focus button, which was mm -hmm. I was I wasn't used to it. So I had to reset it and. And put it back in the box because we're not allowed to touch it till tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now it's you funny because you, you've mentioned the D. You've mentioned the D seventy one hundred a couple times, and um, you know I think this is kind of a big launch for Nikon. There's a lot of eyes on them, especially with the sensor problems that they've been having. They've taken a really interesting approach on their advertising for this one. So this is one of their more recent ads. <laughs> <laughs> I think good should have a question mark beside it, though. <laughs> Our first good camera? Oh, God. <laughs> we are going to get sued. I know it. Oh, and you know what? Really, I have a real beef with Nikon, those idiots. I'm used to teaching the camera workshops, and all these you know, consumer-level cameras, you expect them to all do the same thing. Right? I was teaching a class, there was nothing but D7000 cameras in the class. And I'm saying to everybody, push the shutter button down part way, the camera's going to beep. Right? And everybody pushes the shutter button down part way, there isn't a sound in the room. I said, well, try it again. Make sure you're in the auto mode. Nikon's defaulted to turning the beep off by default on the D7000. Oh, interesting. So I can't remember what it was on my D800, but I know on my D300, the beep was on. And I thought, well, you know, that's more the professional... <laughs> there you go. No, after good. <laughs> okay. All right. Back to the editing board. <laughs> so I, right. guess, I guess we're going more into stealth mode with the uh, 7000 series of cameras. Oh, and, and speaking of stealth, the 7100 is very quiet. It's very, hmm. very nice and quiet. I That's do like nice. that. Yeah. I, I haven't heard it yet tonight. No, that's yeah. right. Go figure. It's like it's not even there. <laughs> um, I have been waiting a really long time, <laughs> Gabe. There we go. That's good. <laughs> that's can, you see, can you see the, uh, I don't know if it, if it comes out. Can the question We hope. <laughs> we hope. <laughs> oh, wow, that is really small. <laughs> there um, we go. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been wanting a second body for quite a while. Um, the full yeah. frame is great, but you know when you're shooting a trip like we're going to the Muskoka Wildlife Center on Sunday or Algonquin Park at the end of April, um, on these trips it is really nice to have a little bit more telephoto range. So I've always wanted to have that crop sensor camera for those things, for hockey, for for other things like that. So I've been waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting uh, a good four years now, and the 7100 is actually the first camera that I am seriously considering to make that choice. Uh, I've been waiting for like a D400 series, uh, but after playing with the 7100, I'm quite impressed. And I think that is a camera that I could I could add to my kit. Why wouldn't you look at the D7000 and save yourself a bunch of cash? Didn't like it. No? Really noisy, uh, the sensor dust problems. I didn't like the ISO control. I didn't like the look of the photo. I didn't like the operation of it, the speed of it. Uh, the 7, 7100 is faster. It has the additional crop factor. Um, the, it it's has an extra a, 100 better. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it's an extra 100. I need that 100. <laughs> but it, now what really impresses me is that it has the same focusing system as the 300 series or as the 700. So you have the 51-point autofocus instead of the 39-point autofocus. And believe it or not, I know it sounds silly, I use the points. The more points you have, the smaller the gap between the points. 
And if you're trying to choose a very subtle area, like when we're shooting hockey, and I want to take that focus point, move it over to the side, so when they're traveling that way, I can literally keep my focus point here and just follow along and keep them on the edge of my shot. Um, I use it for things like that. Or if I'm trying to compose a photo where I have a, my camera on a tripod and I don't want the focus point to move from a very specific spot, having more focus points gives me much more control of where my focus point will be. Mm. And you guys know focus is key, right? So, oh, uh, and then you should mention then Nikon's 3D focus tracking system where you can actually see the focusing point moving around in the screen. It, right. it gives, gives you a little bit of a headache, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you mean the worst thing ever. <laughs> I, I used it the last time we shot hockey, and I actually kind of liked it a little bit, um, but I turned it off right away. Yeah, you don't find it. I, I, it's horribly intrusive. Yeah. But yeah. it's good if you're doing a portrait of somebody you want to walk and recompose and make sure the focusing point was mm -hmm. on their eye. Exactly. Yeah, and, but for know. sports or something, yeah, it's just in the way. Um, another really cool thing, and Gabriel, what was that little handheld little device that you had? Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, no. I, I see the stabby look in your eye. <laughs> Exactly, you know what I'm talking about. Show okay. your finger. Now you didn't know which one that is. <laughs> For those of you who don't know our private joke, um, <laughs> Nikon cameras have a really interesting thing built into them called an intervalometer, meaning I can set this camera to take a certain photo as often as I want it to take it, for as long as I want it to take it, up to 1,000 photos which is great for time lapse. And, oh, thank you, Darren, for showing these things because I don't have a plug-in super cool thing. You can, you can start now. You can choose a start time, so you can wait until a certain time before it starts. You can go in and fiddle with a million things in the menus and how many pictures over how many seconds. Now, this, this is a really cool feature. If you want to do time-last photos of the stars moving across the sky, me shoveling the front lawn or, or mowing the back lawn, um, even better. And this is something that Trey Ratcliffe just showed me, which I think is the coolest thing ever. And by the way, no, Trey doesn't know me. He talked about it, and I was watching. Um, <laughs> I wish Trey knew me, but that's a whole different conversation. Anyway, um, if you have your camera on bracketing to shoot an HDR photo, uh, I have it. I'm not going to bother telling you how to do it right now. Basically, it's on... Oops. Wow, that was a thumpy shutter. <laughs> <laughs> So basically, you put your camera in bracket mode. You go into the menu. You find your interval timer shooting option. Let's see if I can show you this little trick here. Yeah. Interval timer shooting. You hit over. Of course, from that angle, forget it. I'm not going to do that. You hit over. You hit back to the, the, back to the left. Hey, let's try this one more time. Interval timer shooting. Yes. Left. Up. OK. Done. Now, as soon as you hit this, uh, hit OK, it will literally timer, and then, and then take the five photos. Well, it has to focus. Let's turn that off. Boom. Takes the five pictures, and you're done. So you literally, you have your camera in bracket mode. You don't need a remote control to activate it. You press a couple buttons, boom, 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 and set your camera down, and it'll take a picture two seconds later, or take five pictures in a row two seconds later, or seven or nine, or whatever hmm. you program your thing to do. So it's super straightforward. Again, I'm on bracketing. I've chosen that I'm taking five pictures. I hit menu, interval timer shooting. I hit right, left, up, OK, and that's it. Hmm. So now I've got five non-shaking, perfect pictures of my cluttered desk that has highlight exposure blinking like crazy. Couldn't you set the two-second self-timer and do the same thing? Uh, no. Because it'll only take one photo. Exactly. Okay. By, by doing now, it through interval shooting, it'll actually remember to take those five photos, and then it can stop. In Canon's defense, you can add this functionality to just about any Canon camera for, I mean, a measly $250 upgrade. I mean, it's... Really? Actually, let, let's, let's, let's be on the side of reality here. $250 might buy you the Canon version, but the Hano one that you have is $129.99. It, oh, okay. 
as bad as fun- people may think. And you can do very similar <laughs> things, except for that auto funky thing that that does. But yeah. So I mean, after you spend you know fifteen hundred dollars for your seven D, you're only looking at an additional about a thousand dollars to gain all the same functionality as an icon. But if you think about it, my Nikon was twenty five hundred dollars, so it almost works out the same. It's true. It's true. <laughs> um, oh, Joseph, Brian, put my name on for one of the D seventy one hundreds. Okay, <laughs> twist my arm. You got it. Um, actually, you know what, Joseph? If you can call me at the store. Anyway, um, anything else to add tonight, guys? No, I think we're good. I think we're good. I think we covered a lot of ground on Nikon. We said some good stuff. We've said some not so good stuff. And um, ultimately, guys, the reason we did this show once again wasn't to say that you should buy a Nikon or you should buy a Canon. We're opening up what options these cameras have in a way that hopefully you'll see something if you do like it or not. Or maybe it'll Mm -hmm. teach you something about the camera you already have. Or maybe it'll give you a little more confidence with what you're working with. These are tools, guys. This is a Stanley hammer. Gabriel has a Mastercraft hammer. Who's going to build a better home here? I don't know. Mastercraft. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering I don't know how to build a home, probably you. But, uh, and definitely Darren, because Darren can actually build stuff. But um, that, I guess you get my point. Mm-hmm. Learn how to use the tool you have. Learn how to use it the best you can use it. Experiment and shoot and practice and practice and practice and practice. Um, I can't say that enough. The more you take pictures and review your photos, the more you're going to start to hone in on the results that you really, really want to get. I mm-hmm. uh, usually like to close the show with a quote. Uh, wait a second. We have one more comment. Um, Blake. What did he say? They had to come down to Canon's level of good this time. <laughs> yeah. And uh, exclusive lenses. What do you mean by that, Blake? Exclusive lenses. Do you guys know what Blake means by exclusive lenses? Um, lenses that are available for Nikon that aren't made oh, by right. Canon in the same range? Right. No, because with Canon we talked about the MPE65 being a lens that Nikon doesn't have anything close to. Right. I, I don't think Nikon really has much of that. Um, a 16-35 to 35 VR lens. That's true. That's true. They do have a stabilized ultra wide, which is nice. Um, great, great for me. Great for what I do. Mm-hmm, definitely. And you don't need to have an f two eight like the Canon's version. F four is appropriate for your what you're doing because you're not shooting at f two eight anyway. You're shooting it's at f eight f eleven or something probably, or more. Got a gr- great way to do uh, custom white balance. Super easy way to do custom white balance. That's right. Well, actually, we didn't even talk about that. That's a great point there, Darren. Um, I, I use this. I use this all the day or every day. The D seven thousand and the seventy one hundred will have the same thing. Whereas in, if you push and hold the WB button, turn the back wheel, you're changing to you know from auto to daylight to cloudy to tungsten. But if you leave it on auto, push and hold the white balance button, and turn the front wheel, one direction you're skewing the tint more to amber, and the other direction you're tinting it more to blue. So if I'm bouncing my flash off of a wall that has a little bit of a yellow tint, I'll leave it in auto white bounce, but I'll shift it to more of a blue 4 or 5, and I get a better white balance corrected photo without having to fiddle with too many menus. That's a great point. Definitely. So for me, I have to put up with that menu bank crap that I don't like, but for the white balance shift and doing a white balance preset on Nikon camera, like just... I'd drive myself crazy if I was trying to do it any other way. And Blake also pointed out the, um, oh, quite a few, he's, he's still going actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, there's more. Um, he has said the 14 to 24, my favorite lens. If anybody's ever seen my Day Trooper Photo business card, yoink. That image right there was taken with the 14 to 24 at 14 mil. It's a really nice rectilinear corrected lens. You can't really, it looks like crap right there. Um, yeah, let's just put that away. So, anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, the 14 24, I love that lens. It's part of the holy trifecta of lenses the 14 24, 24 70, 70 200. Uh, or the quinfecta, which includes the 85 prime and the four other lenses. Um, 
the 105 uh, DC. Actually, Blake bought this lens. The, oh, cool the, lens, yeah. Yeah, the 105 DC. Darren, maybe you can explain what makes the DC so different from the 105 VR. We'd have to get Ross to do this. <laughs> uh, but it's it's a defocus control where you can control the way the out of focus part of the photo behaves. I think hmm. Blake actually talked about that lens on on our lens episode. Blake was one of our guests on for that episode. Mm-hmm. So uh, if anybody wants to go into a little bit more about what that lens is all about, then just check out our lens episode, and uh, you'll be able to see that DC lens that he talked about. He also mentioned a thirteen point a thirteen millimeter f five point six. I don't know that one. I've got an eight millimeter, but it's a signal one. one. Why would you want a 13 millimeter prime that's a 5.6? Ultra wide. Right. Ultra wide. Could be fun. Well, it's something they do different, right? If you're in a riot and you know you're right up next to the police, so at least you know you can see what's going on. Yeah. Because you're getting whacked with a club. And... Is that that? <laughs> Blake was talking about one of those lenses before that was like about this wide. No, What's it's like name? a zero. Millimeter. <laughs> no, not, not not the aperture, just the physical size of the lens. Um, actually, yeah, the one that can actually take a picture behind itself. Oh, here we go. Blake, you are awesome. I think you should just be, like, King Blake. There you go. Hmm. Interesting. The Holy Grail, apparently. Okay. Well, and uh, I like this little, this little tag right here. Please help KenRockwell.com. Okay, I, I have to say this now because you brought his name up. But <laughs> read his article about how you can afford anything. And he talks about he goes into a restaurant and he doesn't order Coke, he gets water because that way his bill is less. And he doesn't realize that the waitress that is working there needs those tips so that she can afford to put herself through school and college. So why am I going to donate to you when you're being so damn cheap and you go out for a drink you know, or for a meal? Applause, applause, applause. Where's the sound effect? I don't want to clap into the microphone. But if you look on Ken Rockwell's website, look at the photo of him holding the camera. And his finger is on the shutter button. And it's not a mirror image. And you tell me what's wrong with it. Um, is this a, a hypothetical? Oh, okay. Hang no, on a second. It's not a hypothetical. Just Ken is getting a little free publicity from us right now, apparently. That's the photo. Okay, good, good job. Um, looks like which, it's over the shutter to me. Over the his finger line. is on the shutter button. Which hand what? is he using? That's backwards. The camera's facing him. No. Well, yeah, because Ken, Ken Rockwell is left-handed. So am I, but that doesn't mean I can press the mode dial button and take a picture. Okay, okay, well, he's using his left hand to trigger the shutter. What's wrong with that picture? It's flipped. Something's weird. No. Tell me. If you read read his website, Nikon made an experimental left-handed camera. Hmm. And he got access to it. He borrowed it, and that's why he uses this as the photo for his website kind of says who he is, you know, just by looking at the photo. But I thought that was kind of cool because there's a lot of left-handed people in the world. Why Steve, wouldn't, yeah. huh? Why Steve wouldn't they make a left-handed on, camera? Steve Lay just pointed out, he has a left-handed camera? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't a production model. It was a like a, a one-off kind of special, special thing. Hmm. That is cool. Well, you know what? One day I'll be Ken Rockwell, <laughs> and I'll have my own left-handed camera. Instead of having to train myself to work. Yeah, but then you have to shoot shoot in small, basic JPEG. Well, forget it. Keep it. I'm doing all right with my right hand. I'll live. (laughs) (laughs) Interesting, though. That's really cool. I'm glad you brought that up. All right, guys. I think we are doing pretty good. I think we are all set here. Uh, So let me give our uh, quote of the day. And today's quote is from Ansel Adams. He says, uh, for those of you who don't know, Ansel Adams was a pianist, uh, photographer. um, He was a real environmentalist, but he was a multi-talented artist. So he says, he tried to keep both arts alive, but the camera won. I found that while the camera does not express the soul, perhaps a photograph can. Hmm. I love it. Oh, wait a second. Steve says... um, 
<laughs> no, I can't read that. <laughs> <laughs> Click off the air and then repeat it. <laughs> yeah, it was... Um, okay, so basically I talked about Ken Rockwell, and then Steven says, but then you'll have to... <laughs> oh, uh, don't be Ken Rockwell. <laughs> so there you go. Oh, nice. Hey. <laughs> and my own self-censoring right there. Uh, thank you, Steve, for the comment. Okay, that's it for the today, guys. Uh, unless you two have anything else to add? No? no. Okay, Good. beautiful. What are we so, doing next week, Brian? Next week is still up in the air. We were going to talk about Samsung. We haven't uh, locked that down yet. So, actually, we had another show in the works that we were talking about, and it could very well be something along that line. Which line was fake that? Fake announced that it was fake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we will post that as soon as we lock it down. We don't want to commit to something that we're not fully uh, going for yet. So We could do focus, focus stacking, talk about all the different focusing options on different cameras. Uh, you guys are going to the Wildlife Center, so, you know, you're going to be t telling people about, you know, the dynamic area or the AFC mode. You know, I think that's a brilliant idea. I think there's a, a large call for us to do a show on focusing and a new show on exposure. Uh, the Briangle, per se, trademark. <laughs> trademark. Uh, so, yeah, you know what? I think maybe next week um, we will talk about focusing. Beautiful. And then the week after that, we'll do the Briangle. How about that? There you go. I'm tired of these shows on cameras. So, focus in on our show next week. <laughs> Beautiful. And uh, for those of you who don't remember, my name is Brian Weiss. I run Day Tripper Photo. We take you on nature walks and teach you how to use your camera. As Darren says, we're going to the Muskoka Wildlife Center on Sunday. It is booked up solid, so please don't try and register for that because you'll be extremely disappointed and angry at me. Uh, <laughs> and Darren, maybe you can uh, reintroduce yourself. I'm Darren Gahan. I uh, own DG Virtual Tours. If you're looking to have your house photographed, call me. If you're looking for some private training, uh, you can also send me an email. And I also teach workshops for Henry School of Imaging. So if you want to learn in that environment, Photoshop Elements, Lightroom, camera workshops, uh, we have them all. I'm at the Markham store, so book your workshops at the Markham store. Keep me busy. Very good. Absolutely do that. And Gabriel, sir, maybe you can tell us more about yourself. Yeah, so I'm, I run uh, Bousquet Photography with my lovely wife, Trish, and we shoot special events and weddings and birthday parties and family portraits. Uh, we do on-site portraits, so we bring the studio to you. Um, yeah, that's Beautiful. what we do. So uh, bousquetphotography.ca, you can contact us for um, some awesomeness. Absolutely, and i got to tell you, um, this isn't... I guess it is bragging a little bit, but I'm very, very proud that these guys do associate themselves with me. It makes me feel good as a photographer because we've got some serious talent here on the panel and our friends like Ross and a lot of other people where, you know, these are guys that are brilliant photographers, amazing educators, and really care about helping you make better photos. So if you really want to get um, some good help from some really cool people, Get in touch with us in any capacity that you would like, and we're more than happy to spend that time with you. So if you guys don't have anything else to add, we will sign out and say goodnight to everybody. Cool. All right? Beautiful. Have a great night, guys, and see you next week for our show on how to focus. So focus in on it. <laughs>